I just thought I was on mute for a second. Um, all right, so thank you all for joining today uh, to get some insights into some of the work that we just recently completed um, on examining the health impacts of extreme heat in New Brunswick. Uh, so this is a very important topic um, given a lot of our focus now um, in terms of health um, and health uh, Emergency planning has turned to um, thinking about impacts of climate change, uh, and heat is one of those anticipated impacts. Um, so for us in New Brunswick, um, we can maybe think about this being a little bit far-fetched, given we don't have that much heat. Um, but I think one important vulnerability for us here in New Brunswick um, is that we're not used to uh, heat. Um, so when we have heat events that are uh, extended um, and high intensity, um, that creates um, particularly different conditions than we're used to, uh, which increases uh, a population level vulnerability. Um, so we're really interested in trying to start to just dissect some of this uh, to help understand what was happening here in New Brunswick um, with the goal of really helping to inform um, on uh, mitigating the negative health impacts associated with uh, some of these um, environmental exposures. Um, so we have uh, this project where we're, we're uh, divided into phase one and phase two. Um, so today we're talking about phase one. Uh, we're right in the process of working on phase two. I'll allude to it um, throughout my presentation um, in terms of what additional pieces we'll be looking at. Um, but our first phase of the project really was to dig into the data to help understand who was vulnerable and how were they vulnerable um, using the data sets we had available. Um, so I'll just get right into the presentation. Um, and we'll have some questions at the end. Um, so save your questions and I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Um, so just as a bit of a background, this is probably not a surprise to many of you, but just to center the, the presentation. Um, so the extreme heat events are really an anticipated consequence of climate change. So we're expecting more, um, more intense, uh, longer durations. Um, and so this is where um, we have important implications for action and better uh, need, more need for research specifically in our specific populations. Um, there is a lot of research um, on heat um, uh, globally, um, limited here in New Brunswick. And so this is some of the first uh, projects that we're looking into this problem. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, our northern countries are particularly vulnerable given we're not acclimatized to this high temperature. Um, and we know that certain subgroups of the population are at greater risk. I mean, we're all at risk of heat um, to some extent, um, but it really depends on certain characteristics of the individual that make them more vulnerable. Um, uh, for example, we have a lot of evidence to suggest that older adults are more vulnerable, uh, people who live alone are more vulnerable, those with chronic conditions, or who have more socioeconomic vulnerability. Um, so the literature is very, the scientific literature is very clear on some key subgroups that are more vulnerable due to characteristics, um, whether it be personal characteristics, biological, physiological characteristics, um, structural characteristics. Um, so there's a a lot of different factors that play into um, an individual's vulnerability. Um, for uh, people in New Brunswick, we can also think about the potential for the coinciding of some of these characteristics, which increase people's vulnerability even further. Um, so using the approach um, at, uh, that we proposed in this data, we were able to look at some of these populations and, and are even able to dig deeper. And that's what we continue to, to work on. Um, so in times of extreme heat, vulnerable populations are more vulnerable. And how are they more vulnerable? Well, we find um, that they are in more need for health services. So be people become unwell when heat strikes um, and they become unwell in different ways. Um, but this tends to lead to an increased need for emergency services, need for hospitalization. And we also see in the literature that there's an increased risk of mortality associated with extreme heat events. Um, and so this is important information um, for us to understand what are the potential impacts. Um, of course, we acknowledge that there's many impacts that are not sort of the tip of this iceberg that we're really capturing here, um, that there's a lot of uh, personal and social types of outcomes that are also related to being vulnerable to heat that we're not able to characterize. But these are the ones that we're really aiming to focus on on our work because of the data we have access to. 
So our rationale for this work was really to provide robust insights into which populations are more vulnerable to and how how the need for health services changes when we have extreme heat events. Um, and this can really help us in two ways. Um, so first is prevention and the second is response. So in planning for heat events that are expected to come in the subsequent summers, for example, in understanding who is more vulnerable and how are they more vulnerable and to what extent, um, we're able to to sort of target measures to, under, to understand um, who we may target, and then we can evaluate um, the impacts of those um, measures. Um, we also can uh, look at this from a response perspective. Um, when we have extreme heat events, who um, do we need to uh, make sure we're able to respond and meet the needs of in that response and recovery stage of the events? Um. So overall, our research objectives for this first phase was to define who or identify uh, in New Brunswick, uh, based on what we know from the literature, who is most vulnerable to extreme heat events. Um, so we had two parts to this first phase. Um, I'm talking specifically today about the first part, um, but the second part uh, is also a complementary to this uh, uh, part one. Um, part one is where we were aiming to characterize the impacts of extreme heat um, among uh, vulnerable populations. And in part two, we want to characterize the distribution of these vulnerable populations. So if we identify that a population is more vulnerable, what is the burden across the province and where might these targeted measures need to be um, uh, implemented more so because of the differential burden. So we were able to use the same data to help characterize this. Um, so we did uh, all our research uh, with population-based administrative data that's available through the New Brunswick Institute for Research Data and Training, or NBIRDT, and it's the institute that I'm affiliated with, um, and we have the legal authority to link administrative data together, so we have master data sharing agreements um, with many different um, government departments um, that help us to do research, um, and NBIRDT really is a research data center, so the use of the data is intended for research purposes um, to help in, uh, inform the evidence needs of people within government, communities, and other trusted partners um, to make sure that we're using the data for the benefit of the population. Um, at NBRDT, we do research. Um, we also do evaluation. We provide access to this data for these purposes to our internal staff like myself, but also to the wider research community um, and as well as partners outside of the research community in collaboration with researchers. Of course, because we're getting into all of this research, knowledge translation like today's event is one key measure that we use to share what we've learned and what we're doing um, with this important resource. And of course, as, as, as part of all this, we're also really interested in training and building capacity in this area. Administrative data is quite novel and its use is quite novel. And so we're really wanting to encourage its use um, so that it's adopted more uh, widely um, and used uh, to uh, increase um, the knowledge and, and evidence to help our population. Um, all right, so uh, just diving into the method. So I am a researcher, so I'll get into a little bit more of the technical aspects of the work. Um, and um, some of these might be more of interest to some on this call than others. Um, so feel free um, at the end to ask questions if you have, um, but also um, to um, glaze over if it's not of interest necessarily. Um, so I had already iterated the objective. Um, I'll just give you a sense of the overview of the method. So this included all individual that lived um, within 40 kilometers of a weather station um, in New Brunswick um, that we had data accessible for. Uh, we identified people who lived in the summer months and we looked at data from 2007 to 21. We identified vulnerable populations among the whole population of New Brunswick over this 15 year period um, to uh, identify demographic, socioeconomic and health related characteristics of individuals in New Brunswick. Um, and then we, using weather data, we uh, 
de defined days that were hot, and I'll get into the criteria for that in a couple slides, um, using uh, the first level of the heat alert response system. So the HARS system is a federal program uh, that the provincial uh, governments also implement in the provinces to alert um, the population of um, extreme heat events. And so there's criteria and we based our research on that. Um, so we were aiming to compare health outcomes on days that were hot with days that were not hot um, to understand how much more emergency room hospitalization or mortality was happening. So I'll get into more specifics. So as I mentioned, all the data we used is linked administrative data accessible at NBRDT. And so we use different data sources for different purposes. Um, so in order to develop the cohort, so who are the individuals living in New Brunswick near those stations during those summers in those years? Um, so we use Department of Health data to identify um, individuals and their proximity to the stations. Uh, we obtained uh, data from Environment and Climate Change Canada on historical weather information about maximum and minimum temperatures on a daily basis um, at stations um, across New Brunswick. We identified vulnerable populations using Department of Health and Statistics Canada data, and I'll get into more details in a few slides, um, and health outcomes were derived using Regional Health Authority and Department of Health data, um, including information about death and hospitalizations, as well as the Regional Health Authority emergency room data. So in order to develop the cohort, we use the Medicare registry data. So that's the health care card data um, information that's recorded when an individual registers for a health care card. Um, and so that information is then logged and in this data set, which we're able to use um, as part of this research. Um, so we use that to identify who were living in New Brunswick for the period, the full period of May to September um, during each summer month, each summer in each of those years. Um, in order to geocode people within our population, uh, in our cohort, uh, in the population, we use their six digit coast postal code, um, which we use a program called PCCF Plus that's uh, developed by Statistics Canada to allow us to assign postal codes to Statistics Canada geographies. And we chose to use a dissemination areas and there's about uh, 1400 or 1500 of those across New Brunswick. And those are the smallest area we can get here in New Brunswick when we're thinking about Statistics Canada geographies. Um, so those include about four to 700 people. But as you can imagine, some of these disseminations are very large um, in rural areas because we have dispersed populations. Um, so in order to do this mapping, uh, we used ArcGIS to define how far people lived, or not that they lived, but how far their dissemination area was from each of the stations. Um, we restricted to individuals within 40 kilometers of a weather station to include in our final cohort. Um, our current work, we're sort of expanding that a little bit further um, to include more of the population. Using this strategy, we didn't really exclude too much of the population, but about an eighth of the population we were excluding. So we thought that it might be important to include uh, in subsequent work. So we're exploring how that's impacting our results um, in, in ongoing work. Um, so these were the stations that we used in the study. If you know about stations, you might be like, well, where are the other stations? Um, so these are the stations that we included because we included stations that were co-located with hospitals. We just thought that individuals who were further, who were close to a station who was that was further from a hospital may have different behaviors when it's hot versus um, those who are closer. And so just as a first look in this research, we wanted to try to keep things as clean as possible. And so we really wanted to um, make that restriction. And so that's why we've included only these 13 stations um, as they were co-located with hospitals, which we had good data for. All right, so we looked at 18 vulnerable populations, so it's quite a number of populations, and then within those, um, there were some different iterations. Um, but overall, we looked at three kind of areas, so the demographic, the socioeconomic, and the health-related. You'll notice that the health-related um, data is a shorter time period, uh, but that's because we didn't have uh, di information on chronic diseases that are listed here after 2018, so that's the most recent data we had. So the summers of 2019, 2020, and 21 are not included in that analysis when you, we were looking at those um, populations. But the other characteristics are for all the 15 studies, uh, uh, 15 years. Um, so we looked at age as a demographic factor. We looked at children, age eight, 18 and under, 
it's a bit of a wide age range. Our current work is looking much more narrow. Um, age range, older adults was definitely something of interest. We initially started with just thinking about older adults over the age of 65, um, but our analysis also um, led us to looking at older, older adults. And so um, we, we have uh, some data on those who are over the age of 85, I think. Um, household composition was also really important um, in our data, but we don't have a really good sense of that. So this is one of the data elements that is quite limiting, um, but we know that um, these characteristics are really important. Um, so we wanted to try to look at it, but we acknowledge that there's a you know misclassification in that information for sure. Um, socioeconomic information, we do not have at the individual level. So this is where the linkage with Statistics Canada geographies is really helpful because Statistics Canada obviously has a lot of information from the census. Um, and so this census information is what's used to derive some information about area level residential instability, economic dependency, ethnocultural composition, and situational vulnerability. And depending on the range of scores in an area, um, categories are created. And so Statistics Canada tends to create five categories from the data that they uh, create. Um, and so those five categories divide the population into 20% categories. And so what we focused on for this analysis was those that were most vulnerable. So in the fourth and fifth, so you can imagine it being the four, the the forty percent population, forty percent of the population that's the most vulnerable in each of these. Um, so some areas might have high residential instability, but not economic dependency. So the factors that feed into these are a little bit different. With respect to health characteristics, we look at a number of chronic conditions, which we know are important factors. Um, we find some really interesting things, as I'll show you soon, but we need to do more work here, too, uh, to just dig into why are um, specific people with these conditions more vulnerable so we can be more targeted in our messaging. Has, does it have to do with the physiology of their condition? Does it have to do with the prescriptions that they may take for their condition, what are the factors that might be related. So certainly this is a first look and there's a lot more to do, as you'll see. Um, this was just a bit of a busy slide, but I just wanted to show it to you because it relates to this middle box here with respect to the socioeconomic characteristics. And I mentioned that we use the census data and it asks, it combines a bunch of different questions that come from census data. So individuals answer these questions and then Statistics Canada aggregates them up and then creates some kind of um, statistical score for the area, which then assigns a, a value of one to five. And so just to give you a sense of what's in some of these uh, categories, when we think about residential instability, um, we think about the, not, the percentage of people who live alone, the percentage of people who rent, the percentage of people who live in apartment buildings, the percentage of people who live who are not married, um, sorry, and then the percentage of people who are, are maybe more mobile given they have moved in within the last five years. So these in this information is used to characterize um, uh, area level residential instability and the other measures uh, do something similar, but of course with different types of measures. That's a really helpful and insightful measure um, and I've posted the link here so that you're able to uh, link out to it if it's of interest. And those data are available open source as well. Um, so in order to define heat days, um, we use the first criteria of the HARS program. Um, New Brunswick has three levels of HARS. Other provinces only have one level. Um, the first level for all provinces is quite similar, um, but some have slight differences. The New Brunswick definitions are shown here. Um, they are a minimum temperature of 30 or above for two days in a row. So if it's just one day, it's not a hot a heat alert day, it has to be two days. Um, and if those two days, the temperature at night is below 18, then it's not considered a heat alert day or a heat wave. It is considered um, two hot days. Uh, for the purposes of our analysis, we had to have two days in a row to be defined as a heat alert day. Um, independent of those criteria, if two days in a row are humidex 36 and above, regardless of the temperature or the nighttime um, temperature, the daytime or the nighttime temperature, um, they that is also um, 
uh, defined as a heat alert day. And so this, um, this is two ways that we use to define, and this is the same that are applied or similar that are applied to, by Environment Canada. And again, we looked at those between May and September. As you can imagine, we had a lot more heat alert days in August and July than in May and September, but those are really common bounds to be using. Um, we also sampled a bunch of non-alert days. So obviously we got a lot of those in May and September. Um, so these were days that weren't hot. Um, we also spaced them in time from those hot days just to like reduce the effects of that impact. Um, so we they had to be more than four days away. And initially, we didn't apply a criteria based on temperature. Um, but as we were doing the work, we start to feel a little bit uncomfortable about a cutoff of, you know, 29 degrees, 30 degrees. And uh, and what does this mean? And, you know, how different is that? And if we're using that as a comparison. So what we ended up doing was creating a, a, a cutoff of some like sense of like a typical nice summer day. So if it's less than 25 or less, I mean, it's still hot, but it's not as uncomfortable as when you're getting above 30. So we use that to select non-alert days. Um, to be honest, it didn't really have a huge impact on the result, but um, just to be able to explain it better and feel more comfortable with the results, this is why we approached it this way. Uh, so these were the three outcomes we looked at. Um, so I mentioned some of the chronic disease data. Oops, sorry. Um, some of the chronic disease data was only available till 2018 summer. Um, so the emergency room data um, is only available in the most recent five years. Uh, so it wasn't available to us before 2017. So that data or that outcome is only for those last five years. Um, the number of health outcomes was derived at each station for each day. Um, and so we looked at the average number on hot days and was that different than the average number on not hot days? And so that's what our analysis was really based on. Of course, it was much more complicated than that. Uh, we used very fancy, complex regression model approaches to compare these because, of course, we need to adjust for all these different things. Um, so, you know, Fredericton Station is much more people on a daily basis than Bathurst Station. Um, so, of course, we need to adjust for station. We did notice, and I'll show you some slides, some trends over time. Um, so depending Depending on the year, of course, that is important. I mentioned the month impact already. So May is not going to be really hot. And so when, you know, temperatures are, you know, 15 or, you know, that's very different when it starts to get hot and even different just temperature wise, but also different in activity wise. And what are people doing and how much are people doing? More people likely out and doing activities. These things we don't have data on, so we can't control for them. But trying to get some of that um, noise out of the picture is really what we're aiming to do. Day of the week, just because people behave differently on a weekend in terms of health services, maybe um, than a weekday, on a Friday, then a Monday, et cetera. Also, of course, because the temperatures on preceding days are very important for how you're feeling. So if it's not 30 on, you know, the days before, but it's been 29 consistently and then it's 30 for two days in a row, you know, that's going to be different than if it was 15 and then all of a sudden hot. So to be able to, to count for some of that, we've also controlled for lag temperature for those who are more technical. Um, we were really interested in understanding like what was happening over time uh, during these heat alert periods. So we looked at consecutive days. This is not necessarily the best way to approach it. So we're looking at different options as we're continuing the work, um, but this was our first look at this. Um, so the models really provide us with the adjusted percent increase in whatever outcome it is, whether it's death or um, hospitalization or emergency room. Um, and so we'll see the estimates um, provided, um, but I didn't provide confidence intervals for just for the purposes of presentation, but they are there. Um, I don't present everything that we did because it's a lot. Um, I present what we found was uh, consistent with a positive effect. We didn't find any associations which suggested that when it's hot, people are less likely, um, but we often found that there was no association, like uh, not that there was, that there was the dip, the amount of outcome on hot days and not was similar. Um, but for the purposes of the presentation, I've only shared with you the results that were interesting. So there's more. But getting into those. So just some characteristics of what happened over that 15 year period. Uh, so what we found in the data we had, we had about 686 uh, hot days. Um, so the average temperature was 31. The average nighttime temperature was 17, which I thought was an error when I saw it. Uh, when the analyst sent it to me, I thought, isn't it supposed to be 18? It's a very uh, narrow standard deviation. So for those who are technical, that just means that the numbers are all very similar. So overnights in the summers, the temperatures are quite similar on hot 
hot days, um, but because of that criteria of Humidex, um, the night doesn't have to be 18 in that case. So that's where um, that difference was, but it doesn't round to 18, just in case you're wondering. Uh, the average max Humidex, so remember the criteria is 36. We see that about 36, I mean 38. Uh, I've not shown all 13 stations, just the top three stations. So we see St. Stephen, Bathurst, and Fredericton um, as having the most hot days. I was also kind of perplexed seeing Bathurst there, um, thinking that maybe that was an error in the data. Uh, but in fact, Bathurst seems to make it in there uh, because of the Humidex criteria. So while they may have the same temperature as Campbellton, um, Campbellton doesn't have as many hot days. And I guess the, ge the, the geography of Bathurst makes it much more humid. Um, the months, of course, as I mentioned, May and September, barely any hot days, as you know, because you experience this, um, and August and July. Um, so as we were going through this summer, I was really um, experiencing those hot days. We certainly had a lot of them on consecutive and certainly, you know, getting into August thinking, okay, well, our data suggests that there's not going to be as many uh, as we've had through the previous uh, few weeks of the summer. Uh, so most of these hot periods are lasting that two-day period. Of course, that's the minimum for us in this study, um, but some are lasting three days and some are more lasting more than four. We had up to seven day um, heat wave periods um, and there's just not that many of them. So what we did was just collapse those that were four or more days. But obviously it's really interesting to be able to break those out. So with more time, more stations, um, that'll be something that we could probably do in time. Um, so the top three years of um, hot days were more recent years in our analysis, so 2021, 2020, and 2018. And this is just giving you a sense of what that is. So I just mentioned this one, this one, and this one in the previous slide. So those were the ones, the summers that had the most hot days, um, whereas, you know, oh goodness, this was a horrible summer. Um, you know, maybe um, um, not as hot, but maybe still, you know, in those higher 20s, we don't know because the way we defined it is really at that criteria. Um, but this is just giving you a sense of what that number of hot days. And we sampled as many non-hot days as we could. Um, so this is just what the population size looks like uh, on, in each year. So we had 15 years. So on average, each year we have between 100,000 and 150,000 children, for example. Oh, it's 80 plus. I think I had said 85 plus before. Um, you know, just about 200,000 older adults over age 65. And similarly, uh, a larger proportion of people who live alone. Um, and then just thinking about the econ the socioeconomic characteristics and the distribution of those with respect to the population of New Brunswick. So with the chronic conditions, um, any chronic condition is clearly the highest because it just combines people who have any, but you can see it's not, uh, you know, a sum of all these. Um, so people do tend to have uh, comorbidities, and we know this from previous research um, uh, that, uh, not ours, but others, um, that, you know, comorbidity is quite common and comorbidity is quite important for vulnerability to heat. Um, so that is, um, you know, one of the things we were really interested in looking at. We also looked at comorbidities in specific conditions um, because those things are suggested to be more um, risky for heat. Um, so we looked at cardiovascular and respiratory conditions, so people who had both. Uh, we also, just to sort of see what was up, uh, looked at cardiovascular, respiratory, and diabetes, but it's a small number, so we didn't really continue, but we just wanted to sort of verify what we were seeing um, and if we would see a similar association, which we did. Um, one of the groups that we weren't planning initially which we ended up looking at um, because it, it came to us through some oh, additional research was individuals who have schizophrenia. Um, and the research that had been done in BC um, with the heat dome in 2021, they had really found that um, people with schizophrenia have a much more uh, like higher likelihood of mortality during heat. Um, and so this was interesting for us to identify. Um, and so we wanted to look at it. So among people with mental illness, uh, we pulled out those specifically who have schizophrenia. I mean, I just must say the cardiovascular conditions and respiratory conditions, they're a mix of things. And I had said earlier, like there's more to dig in. So this was just really a high level kind of first look and seeing like, what are we seeing? Because um, within cardiovascular disease, for example, we have a wide range of things. So hypertension is one of them because that's a cardiovascular disease or condition, um, but also things like heart failure. So you can imagine amongst that range, maybe you have hypertension yourself and you're like, well, I'm okay during... Um, 
um, you know, if you can imagine maybe someone with heart failure, that experience might be different. And so this is a bit of a mixed bag right now, but our goal is as we have more time and more funding and more research to be able to dig deeper into some of these uh, interesting findings. All right, so now getting right into the meat of all of this um, and really what is, um, what is, what is it that we found and what is important? So um, with respect to emergency, I'm going to talk about emergency first and then uh, hospitalization and then finish off with the mortality. Um, so again, I'm only showing you the things that we found to be um, significant or consistently suggesting an association. Um, the red lines are the first day of a heat wave. So to be a heat wave, it has to be at least two days. So day one and day two are those first two days. And then as I mentioned, day three and the day four plus includes up to seven days of um, of a heat wave. So children, as I mentioned, we looked at under the age of 18. Uh, we do know from the literature that children who are under the age of two are much more vulnerable. So that's something that we're really hoping to dig in a little bit deeper um, in future work as well. But children under the age of 18 have about, you know, a less than 5% increase in need for emergency room on hot days. Why? We don't know. We need to dig in deeper as well. Older adults, we were certainly expecting it. Um, as people age, they become more frail, but they also have conditions. We didn't look at the combinations of older adults and conditions, um, but that certainly would be warranted for future work. Um, socioeconomic characteristic that showed up in terms of emergency uh, is high ethnocultural composition. So there is some research in the literature that suggests importance of messaging um, and language of messaging. And so these might be important findings to suggest that there might be a need for understanding who um, might not be receiving messages in our official languages, for example. Um, so health-related characteristics, the very typical ones we expected came out. Um, but in addition to that, we saw a really important impact of mental illness, um, especially amongst people who have schizophrenia. So as you can imagine, the line for those who have schizophrenia is quite large, um, but we see that isolated to that first day. So it's really important for us to continue to understand what is that relationship between people and their experience with the health system as um, the heat waves continue. Um, um, schizophrenia is a small portion of those with mental illness, um, and they're still seeing some impacts at later days in mental illness. So we're, we're also really interested in exploring what might be the impacts of longer uh, duration heat waves on uh, people with different mental illnesses. Neurological conditions because of physiology, but also because of um, of um, uh, medications um, because it could also be more vulnerable and we saw this um, uh, in the emergency room but a lot of people with neurological conditions might also be um, connected well with their clinicians and nurses and so we may not see their um, impacts through the emergency room depending on how well they're cared for. Um, those with any chronic condition so just thinking more generally when we think about guidelines of you know people being vulnerable with any chronic conditions we certainly see that as well but maybe more targeted messages um, might be be uh, warranted to uh, uh, inform those who may be additionally vulnerable. Uh, so when we're thinking about hospitalizations, we see things really isolated to the first two days of uh, the heat waves, um, whereas uh, longer uh, heat waves, we don't see that impact. Um, so uh, older adults and people who live alone and older adults who live alone were more likely to uh, need to be hospitalized. Um, um, and this is, you know, hospitalization following emergency room um, visits. So if you didn't see it in the previous one, it's because these people are now more likely to enter um, to a floor, acute floor. Um, we also saw this with respect to the socioeconomic characteristics, because you notice here it's a different socioeconomic characteristic for the hospitalization, uh, whereas the emergency room uh, was the other uh, uh, scale. And so we're seeing some interesting findings. What does this mean? We need to dig into this deeper. So this is really a hypothesis generating exercise. Um, so for the hospitalization, because we had a lot of groups that seemed to be important, I split it up into two slides. Um, so this was the demographic and socioeconomic, and then here is where the health-related stuff comes in. Um, and so here again, just like we saw for the emergency room, we're seeing that people with schizophrenia have an increased risk of uh, needing to be hospitalized on that first day of a hot period, um, which is consistent with what we expected based on the work that had been done in BC. Um, and so it was interesting. We see here too that 
but neurological conditions have quite a large increase. I had mentioned that perhaps people with neurological conditions may not be coming in through the emergency room, um, but may be coming in through um, directed, but there's sort of a combination here as well. Digging deeper, what neurological conditions and why? Um, so we might be able to target strategies as well. And of course, the combinations of conditions were also uh, found to be more um, more prominent on the second day, uh, which is interesting um, in terms of the timelines of these things, but also another area to continue to explore. In terms of mortality, um, this was one where we found the least amount of uh, vulnerable groups, which is good, um, but uh, we did find quite high in relative increases uh, for some of these groups, but I must acknowledge that overall the number of deaths um, each day is so low. So when you see, you know, a 10% increase, a number of deaths is three, um, then we can think of a 3.3 .3 different, a uh, 0.3 difference. So it, these differences are small, but meaningfully, meaningful, meaningful, potentially at a whole population level, meaningful at in places that have higher density as well. Uh, so thinking about, um, you know, different population structures and in, in these characteristics. Um, so demographic, socioeconomic and health related characteristics were found to be associated with increased vulnerability to death uh, with respect to heat. So we had older adults and older adults who live alone. Um, we didn't find it in older adults over the age of 80, so something interesting as well to, to think on and hypothesize. Um, with respect to the socioeconomic characteristics here, we see again um, individuals with um, or individuals living in areas with high ethnocultural composition. So this might be something um, interesting also to understand and target in terms of um, potential health uh, messaging. Um, and residential instability, I had pointed out to you in the earlier slides about um, the different characteristics. So this is really characterizing people who may have less ability to connect. And we know that's a really important part of uh, resilience during heat. Community uh, focus is a very important part based on what we see from the literature um, on averting mortality. Um, and so thinking about um, um, how residential stability may uh, make someone more vulnerable um, because of their lack of connectedness. So this is individuals who are more likely to live alone, to be single, uh, to live in a rented place, which maybe they have less uh, control over in terms of um, access to air conditioning, um, for example. So these are all really important factors. But again, this is just the tip and we're not really sure and we would need more research um, and more data because we don't have a lot of good data to characterize some of these things. Um, so um, it's certainly interesting, but it'll require more work. Um, and as we expected, um, cardiovascular conditions were certainly observed to have a greater uh, increase. Um, there is some research focused on cardiovascular medications um, specific to um, increasing vulnerability to heat. So that's certainly something that we're also interested in exploring um, because we now have access to some prescription data uh, that will allow us to look at how prescriptions in people with these specific conditions might accentuate or reduce impacts through heat. Um, so we can better to understand those relationships. All right. Um, so just to give you an overall summary um, of what we found here in this uh, phase, several populations were really found to be more likely uh, to need emergency room admissions, unplanned hospitalizations, or to die during extended heat periods. Um, increases in health outcomes primarily occurred on those first days of the heat period. Um, impacts of unplanned hospitalizations were really found on those first two days. Impacts on mortality day one, day two, and day three. Uh, whereas we did see um, emergency room admissions increase across um, the range, um, but different for different populations. So really interesting to dig deeper in there as well. So who did we identify based on what we expected in the literature? We did certainly uh, confirm um, those associations, but there were populations that we didn't identify um, differences that we may have expected, but that's also uh, quite interesting to explore and dig deeper to maybe um, be better characterized to understand among those populations um, 
who may be more vulnerable. Uh, so older adults, people with specific chronic conditions, which, were real, which are quite common here in New Brunswick, um, people with mental illness, especially those with schizophrenia, individuals with particular neurological conditions. So as I mentioned, we weren't able to dig into this, but there is some research to suggest people with Parkinson's disease um, because of some um, prescription interactions um, make them more vulnerable to heat, as well as people with um, multiple sclerosis physiologically are more vulnerable to heat as well. Uh, we also found that people living in areas with high residential stability um, and those with higher ethnocultural composition or diversity um, may be more vulnerable um, during extended heat periods. So of course, this is research. So we have lots of strengths and we have lots of limitations and there's always a need for more research. So in terms of strengths, um, we use population-based sampling. So this wasn't us having to go out and find people to participate in our study. We were able to use everyone in the population. We used a longitudinal study design. So we followed the same people over the whole summer. Um, of course, people can move. <laughs> so we were able to follow them over time. If people left New Brunswick, they were no longer included in our cohort for that summer. If they came back, then they were included again. So they had to be sort of here for the period of the summer for us to count them. So that was really a strength of the study, I think. Um, we were able to link data, environmental data, administrative data from very many different sources. So this is really the value of NBRDT um, to be able to do this research. We were able to define several, 18 vulnerable populations, which is pretty impressive. Um, and so this data really lends itself to being able to do this. Each individual served as their own control. So this is really important for from a research and validity perspective um, to um, allow um, confidence in that comparison um, that we're making. And we were able to look at system level impacts. And while that is a strength, of course, we cannot look at some of the things that might be really important to people um, because we don't have the data. So certainly is a strength because otherwise we might not be able to capture this information, but we acknowledge that it is a potential limitation that we can't look at other things um, that might be really important in this way, at least. Um, so of course, limitations for this work, we categorize temperature and humidity as like hot, not hot, uh, which obviously has limitations. I talked a little bit about our uncertainty around that and our choice to kind of cut off the non alert days to be more like a nice summer day as opposed to a starting to get uncomfortable summer day. So we tried to get around that, but we feel like using temperature more continuously would be more informative. And actually that's what we're doing now in our, in our phase two work. Uh, we really couldn't consider, and I'm not sure if you've caught this yet, but we couldn't consider heat specific outcomes. So we have just going to the emergency room, just going to the hospital, just, you know, dying, but we don't know Well, we do know, but we, we can't really do a good job because um, heat related health outcomes are very nonspecific. And the data that we have access to is specific to codes and so encoding approaches. And so sometimes things that may be heat related might be so nonspecific that we can't actually capture them. So what we decided to do was just focus on all causes, but we obviously acknowledge that that's an important limitation. Um, if we had been able to focus on heat specific things, then uh, we would be able to provide more information that is really specific to those reasons that we know are more likely to lead people to have to go to the emergency room or uh, the hospital because of heat. Of course, I mentioned this throughout as well, but we have, while we have a lot of data, we also have some data limitations. And we got to take the good with the bad. Um, emergency room data only five years, the chronic disease data not after 18, and there's no in individual level socioeconomic uh, data currently at least. Uh, all right, so just to end off um, and uh, give you guys a sense of maybe where we're heading with some of this. Um, so extreme heat in events in New Brunswick are associated with negative health outcomes. Um, what we find is very consistent. What is found throughout the literature, nothing surprising here, which is good is what we wanted to see, to know that our approach and our method, which we borrowed from um, best practices in the literature, was giving us the most robust evidence because, of course, we want that to, to be the outcome of our work. Work. Um, and so uh, we're seeing um, an important impact. So aiming to understand what 
these impacts are um, so we can target interventions to maybe help to uh, to help to support vulnerable populations in, in averting negative um, impacts from these events, both in planning um, and responding um, to them. Um, we are moving in our second phase of our work to better understand mitigating effects, and we're exploring impacts of green and blue space, um, specifically in the three core centers in New Brunswick. So Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John um, is what we're going to start with as our first analysis. So this is something we're working on right now and hope to come, be able to come back and share it with you in the future. Um, we, based on the work um, that we did in this project and we're continuing to do, perhaps you know, the first alert criteria that 30 degrees isn't hot enough to be seeing those really negative impacts in the population that we would expect when temperatures start getting higher for longer periods of time. So right now we're also exploring different crit not criteria for the HARS program, because the HARS program is the HARS program, uh, but just different understanding what, uh, how health services differ uh, when different temperatures are reached to better understand what um, the responses might need to be um, and the impacts are on the population to uncover this a lot better. Um, and we're also really interested um, in, or we find it's really important that we're doing this now, to look at that dynamic relationship. So one of the limitations I pointed out was sort of this categorization of like, it's hot, not hot, you know, it leaves a little bit um, to, um, so we would, we are really looking at this dynamic relationship and really looking at temperature and humidity and how do those two relate to these negative health outcomes. And this is the focus of the work um, that we're completing now. So that with that, that ends my presentation for today. Um, so I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to join and listen in. I hope this was interesting, insightful, um, confirming maybe some of the things that you had thought with some evidence, which is always really reassuring. Um, and so happy um, to open the floor to questions. I don't know, Mike, if you're going to uh, manage or what do you think is best? Um, I know I see some no. chats. No, I, I see a hand up there already. I think that might be okay. the best way. If you feel more confident, though, putting questions into the chat, that'd be a great Oh, no, option. yeah, no, it'd be, yeah, so exactly, whatever anyone feels comfortable. I just can't see anybody. That's okay. Maybe I I'll can, just I stop certainly... sharing for now. Okay, we can do that route as well. Uh, there was one earlier in the chat from uh, Meno. Uh, do you have a list of weather stations that were included? I believe that was covered in the presentation, but. Um... Yeah, maybe I can just go back to that just to show you again. Sure. Sorry if I'm going. Oh, I did. <laughs> oh, here we are. Uh, so these were the stations that we included. Um, so there's one station here in Buktush that we had, and we were sort of on the fence of including it or not. But the weather data that came with it wasn't as complete, so we ended up just excluding it. Um, but um, but yeah, so there's a, there's definitely other what other stations. I know there's one up here in Grand Falls. Um, so our radius was 40 kilometers, which is the circle here. And so um, if that red dot wasn't within the circle, that's kind of how we made that uh, arbitrary decision. Really, does that answer your question, Manon? Yeah, she had said in the chat there it was it was yeah. the following slide as well. But hopefully that's some added context for you as well. Um, yeah. And of course, for those that might want to ask questions in French, that's absolutely yeah. totally fine. She will provide answers uh, in English, but please feel free to answer your, or ask your questions in French. Uh, Maureen, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi Sandra, that was a great hi. presentation. Thanks. I wanted to ask you about um, one of the vulnerable categories you had listed, which is ethnocultural composition. Yeah. Um, do you have any like hypotheses or could you speculate at all? Like what are those underlying issues? I found that to be really interesting. Yeah. So when we saw that, we were like, okay, so these are very common measures that we use in a lot of our research because they're quite interesting. They have interesting components to them. Um, and they're one of the many measures that are available that capture a lot of information. So it, they're, they're really nice. Um, but they kind of then, you know, what do they mean? Um, so I'm not sure. Um, we need to dig deeper, I think, certainly. Um, but based on what we saw from the literature or what other people are saying, um, that there is, there's a recognized need for um, tailored messaging. Um, so when we have areas that have more newcomers, for example, where English and French might not be um, their first language or, you know, common to them on a daily basis, the messages that we're sending through alerts might not be recognized. The other, um, other suggestion that people have made in the literature is that, um, 
our strategies might not align with um, people's um, needs. Um, so that might be, um, you know, thinking about cooling centers that are public places, you know, so depending on your background, you might not feel as comfortable um, in that type of situation. And so, you know, so if we can tailor um, interventions to better serve the needs of different populations, like is kind of the messaging that we found people are suggesting in the literature. Um, so we don't know exactly what's happening here, but it's certainly something I think to dig in deeper um, to better understand because we did see it in two of the outcomes um, that we were looking at. Interesting. One of the first things that popped into my mind was like newcomers just have less stuff. So they have less fans in the basement. They have less exactly. they have less families that they could go to who might exactly. have air conditioning. Um, that was sort of the only thing that popped in my head, but I'd be interested yeah. to to look into that because it's the same with, um, with smoke and I'd sort of be interested in what sort of interventions um, could be, you know, communicated to those communities about how to how to protect themselves and stay safe. But without really knowing the cause of it, it's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the work that we do kind of lends itself to digging deeper with like qualitative type of research. So, you know, really getting with these communities and asking questions about their experiences. Um, so now we can kind of target work to better understand. And then we can come back into the amend data to see if we can, you know, sh based on those, um, that knowledge from people's lived experience, if we can represent that better in the administrative data than at a population level. And then kind of this iterative back and forth really helps to strengthen what we're finding in amend data, but then also inform it in a real life way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. If I find anything, I'll definitely keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, another question from the chat. I don't know if you're able to see it down there, Sandra, but uh, do you have any interventions planned as an yeah, outcome from this study? Yeah. So this is really like a first step for us. Um, it's our first um, opportunity to work in heat. Um, it seems like there's quite a lot of interest in terms of you know, federally, provincially, you know, community based. So I feel like there will be potentially, you know, a future opportunity to do some of that, Manon, but uh, currently there's nothing planned. Um, we're still sort of digging into the data. And I'm a population researcher who uses data. So that would be something I would be happy to collaborate on. So if, uh, you know, but would it necessarily be the, the person to be leading it? I guess is what I meant. So any other questions that you don't uh, kiss Joe? Any more general comment? If it's not specifically a question, that's okay too. Yeah. I guess like if anyone is interested, like any, like overall, reflections even or you know anything you found that was not what you expected or you know everything was what you expected you you knew exactly what I was going to tell you, you. <laughs> sorry it's me again yeah. I, I kind of wonder what's the influence of like um like air conditioners you know if certain groups just happen to have more than others yeah. um how that would affect the data yeah, so I wish we had some air conditioning information. Statistics Canada just came out, um, not just, but it's maybe a number of months ago now, but they came out with a report of prevalence of air conditioning and in New Brunswick, it was like 30% around there. Um, whereas in places like Ontario, it was like 80%. So we certainly have less access. Um, with the heat pumps, maybe that'll be different now because we're moving towards that. And that's also in air conditioning. So I'm not sure what that how that affected that study um or like the timing of it but that is something but it's not data we have um but it would be really cool to have because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a huge missing piece in all of this yeah okay. yeah so if there's any knowledge um of data that exists um this is something that we could certainly explore um and it doesn't necessarily have to be data at the population level because even if we have it in like it doesn't have to be all of New Brunswick, but if we can do a sub-study in a small area to understand, you know, impacts of air conditioning versus not, um, that would be really informative as well. But we know that from the literature that air conditioning is an important protective factor, um, but we also know that air conditioning 
exacerbates heat <laughs> if we have urban areas with lots of air conditioning. So thinking about the offsets of some of this. And that's why we're really trying to dig into some of this green space um, area to help understand what impacts that might have to offset some of these other, you know, strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly a lot. Anybody else? If there's if there's none at this time as well, and Sandra, I think you were you had mentioned you're welcome to contact you by email yeah, as well. Sure. If you want to just throw your email into, into the chat before we we sign off. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to talk about this work. Um, we have quite a bit of other work going on. Uh, our website. Um, I could just quickly put it up. Sure. Um, there's um, a projects page where you can see all the research that's happening, quite a wide range of things, not just climate related. Um, you can see our data holdings, so you'll see what types of data sets we have. Please feel free to reach out, happy to talk about collaborations um, and engage in discussions about you know future projects. So feel free to reach out, happy to connect. Um, Right. Well, I mean, if there's if there's nothing else for today, certainly feel free to continue the conversation um, afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. But again, thank you, uh, Dr. McGallis, for for being with us today, and thank you to each and every one of you for for coming and, and participating as well. Uh, I will throw my email in as well if there's anything in BEM related um, after the presentation. Mm -hmm. But if there's nothing else, we'll give you a little bit of time back. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Oh. I'll just away from Maureen. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Thank you so much for the presentation. C'était très uh, informatif. Merci, Sandra. Thanks. Merci. Bonne journée. Not so much as data.